They've got some amazing things planned for our kids this morning, and I hope you're able to get some tickets and stick around uh, afterwards for an uh, unbelievably delicious uh, chicken barbecue dinner. Uh, before we do to that portion, we want to talk for a few minutes this morning about something that's really important. You know, when you look through Scripture, if you've ever tried to read it, it seems like a collection of stories and illustrations and history and some instructions and some poetry. And uh, if you know anything about the history of the compiling of Scripture, you know that it took about 1,500 years of people who wrote things to put that all together. And then you also know that there's about 39 individuals who contributed to it. And it can feel just a little bit random. It can feel as though that uh, maybe it's just a bunch of disconnected stories, almost like a fortune cookie thing. You hope you find the thing you need when you need it. Uh, but there actually is a single great story that is told throughout Scripture, and when you understand the great story, it makes all the other stories, it helps you understand them better. And even more than that, it actually helps us understand ourselves better, because what is true is that you are part of the great story, and the great story is actually God's story. It's His story. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And the, the Bible is not so much a book about people as it is a book about God. And it's not so much a book about what people have done for God as it is about what God has done for people. And so like every good story, it has a beginning. So in Genesis, the very first chapter, the very first verse, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, interestingly enough, we actually have another place in Scripture where it starts out with the words, in the beginning. And it's in John, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and that says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. My grandfather used to take me and my brother and my cousin hunting. And just so you know, uh, no animals actually ever died in one of our hunting expeditions. <laughs> Turns out we were not good at that walking or getting lost. That's what we were good at. And uh, I suspect that Grandpa was just getting us out of the house for a while. But I do remember there was one trip where we were kind of walking down a tree line. I don't remember what animal we were supposed to be hunting that day. But I had an idea while we were walking down the tree line. It was this very thick pine forest. And I thought that must be where the animals are that we're looking for. And I said to my grandfather, why don't we go in there? Because I think that's where they're hiding. And my grandfather said, that's not a good idea. It's too dark in there. And I didn't think it was, and so he didn't stop me. And so I wandered into the darkness. It is some of the thickest covered trees I've ever seen in my life. And within probably 30 feet of walking in, I couldn't see anything in front of me. And I experienced an emotion does anybody happen to know what that emotion might be? It's the emotion of fear. And it occurred to me, I didn't know what was in those trees. It also occurred to me, 
I couldn't see anything in those trees if it came at me. It also occurred to me that maybe whatever was in those trees could see me. <laughs> and suddenly, I did not feel like I was the hunter. I felt like I was the hunted. Now, I didn't run into a sprint because I wanted to keep some coolness in my resolve. And so I walked slowly out and, and regained my, my stride next to my grandfather. And that's when it happened. A pheasant flew out from a little bunch of grass in front of us. And if you've never been near a pheasant when it flies out, it is one of the most terrifying sounds in the world. I thought my heart would never slow down. I thought that thing followed me out and got me. 40% of adults in a study done in the United Kingdom said that they are actually so afraid of the dark that they will not walk around in their house without the lights on. And 10% of adults say they will not get out of bed in the middle of the night even to go to the bathroom. Afraid of the dark. And yet there's actually another kind of darkness I would like to talk about today. And this darkness is actually very difficult to observe. And in fact, people are not afraid of this darkness. They're attracted to it. And that's the problem. The first thing I want you to see this morning is that the great story actually begins with God. It says, in the beginning, God. God is the only one who has no beginning. And I know that is impossible to explain. Because I've, I've had people ask me, how do you explain that God never was, never had a beginning? He's just always been. And I always say, it's just true. <laughs> I, I can't explain it. But here's what I want you to know. Everybody believes that about something. I had a friend in college who didn't buy into the whole faith thing or God thing. He believed that science could resolve all issues and explain all things. And so I got into a conversation one day with him, and he started challenging me about my faith and this, this kind of superstitious belief that there was a God. And he asked me that question, where did God come from? And I said, he always was. He said, how can that be? I said, I, I don't know, but I, I do believe it's true. And he said, well, it can't be true. Everything has to come from something. I said, really? I said, where do you think we came from? And so I followed him all the way down the evolutionary uh, tree until we were nothing but a bunch of amoebic blobs inside of primordial soup. And I said, so where did the soup come from? And he said, well, it, there was a big explosion in the universe. And I said, really? I said, what, what, did, what caused the explosion? He said, well, there was gas. I said, where did the gas come from? He said, the, the gas always was. Now, I'm not surprised that an adolescent male in college believes that there's always been gas. That's not surprising at all. But if you believe gas always was, you're scientific. But if you believe God always was, you're naive. You see, we all believe that there was something that always was. Christians believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And in that creation, he always has a purpose in everything he creates. This is true even today when people create things. There's a purpose for it. If you create a tool, it's to be used in a certain way. If you create art, it's to relay something that you're seeing or feeling. If you, if you create music, it's because you want people to experience the emotion of what it is that you're trying to convey. There always is a purpose in every created thing. So please understand this. If there is no creator, then there is no purpose. Now, I know you can say, well, I'll just make my own purpose up. And you can, and lots of people do. And, and like, all I can tell you is, is that when you do that, uh, you can kind of create your own purpose, but you lose the authority to be able to say that other people are right and wrong in whatever it is that they do, because everyone then has to find their own purpose. And maybe someone thinks their purpose is just to take advantage of you. And you can say, well, that's not right, but on what basis? According to their purpose, you're just there for their amusement or enjoyment or use. See, when you say people are good or bad, the only way you can say that is if you know what their purpose is. 
For example, if you take a medication, that medication has been created by pharmaceutical companies in order to accomplish a purpose. Maybe it's to lower your blood sugar. Maybe it's to increase your insulin level. Maybe it's whatever the, the purpose is. And we would say it's a bad medication if it doesn't accomplish its purpose. And it's a good medication if it does accomplish its purpose. And we would say that there's a lot of risk and danger involved if you used a medication contrary to its purpose. So we understand this. So if you're going to say people are good or bad, then you have to know what their purpose is. Not liking someone or not liking the purpose of their lives is insufficient. You have to, now, there's, a, there's a, a, a stream of thought that says that, that we did kind of evolve, that that's how we got here. But you should understand that the concept of evolution is survival of the fittest. And so the job of the strong is actually to prey upon and devour the weak because we want to eliminate weakness from any species. So if you're an evolutionist, when you see strong uh, organizations and strong individuals uh, take advantage of other people and destroy them, you should actually stand and cheer because your system is working. Your, that system is doing what you think it's supposed to do. But I don't know anyone that stands and cheers when the weak are preyed upon and those who are vulnerable are destroyed. So how can we find what the purpose of humans is? And we can find it by reading scripture because that's his story. He's given it to us. And we can find it by starting conversations with God. And we can find it by being part of communities who want to figure this out in our journey because here's what's true. Other people who also believe that there is a purpose in why we are here in this world they begin to see things about you that you don't see about yourself, and that's very helpful. That communication is really helpful. So the great story begins with God. The second thing is the great story is a love story. I don't know if you noticed it, but it said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then it says, and then the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. So now we have God, and we have the Spirit of God, and then God said, let there be light. There's the Word of God. There's God, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're all there. And why does that matter? Because before there was anything else, there was Father, Son, and Spirit. That means that before there was anything else, there was relationship. Before God ever used his power to create anything, there was relationship. See, some people think that God, I've actually heard people say this, God was kind of lonely, being there all by himself, so he decided to create some people uh, so that he could have a friend, and they've been disappointing him for all of human history. They just, <laughs> it's not working so well for him. And that's, that's not what's true. What is true is that the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was so good, this is what they said. This is too good to keep to ourselves. We should create other beings and let them in. That's what was going on. So all creation happens through the Word of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what we learn is that relationships are actually the most important thing. Everything that we see starts out of relationship. Love can't exist until there's a relationship someone to have a relationship with. If there's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then God can't be love. God can't experience love until he creates something else. And then what is that love? So we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a love story. The love of God precedes the power of God. And until you understand the love of God, you'll never understand the power of God or how he uses it or why he uses it the way that he does. So, most of the times uh, in our world, people don't live up to the idea that relationships are the most important thing. If you want to know, Jesus, Jesus was asked this, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? And he just goes straight to the relationship. Love God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. Like, that's the most important thing. If you get that right, everything else works. And here's the thing. In our world, 
A person might graduate college and then they start a career, they start a family, and so they will be driven to succeed and they will work excessive hours and they will shortchange the needs of their spouse and their children just so they can climb the corporate ladder and they'll do that at any cost and the cost often is their family. And here's what I want you to know. If there is no God and relationships are not the most important thing, then it doesn't matter. He's just getting what he wants. And we should be okay with that. Because he's figured out how to work the system. But the problem is, is that humans don't survive in that environment very well. When relationship becomes secondary to things like power and fame and acquisition and, and success and status, when, when relationship becomes secondary to that, we feel as though we're injured and we experience anger and we experience fear. That's what grows in an environment where relationships are not treated as important. And bruised, damaged people are what come out of it. And here's what I want you to know. We're sitting here in a very beautiful environment this morning with gorgeous weather. And right now, there is a hurricane that's coming into Florida, and, it, it, and it's a scary thing. And we just watched a couple weeks ago as a hurricane uh, slammed into uh, the South Texas coast and did incredible damage. And here's what I want you to know. People are really quite resilient in disaster. Like they will relocate or they will rebuild. Uh, they'll go back in and, and, and rebuild their life all over again. People are remarkably resilient in disaster. It's not disasters that do us in. I've seen people who've been diagnosed with terminal illness and didn't do them in. Like, their spirit stayed strong. What does us in, what people can't recover from, is, is when there's someone that we trusted and we thought they loved us and then they betrayed us. That puts us into a realm of darkness that some people never come out of. We're not built for that. You and I were created for relationship. Relationship with God and relationship with others. And until we experience that, everything else is just a distraction or it's just a medication. You were created for relationships. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been in that. And when you read Scripture, you discover that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always focused on the other. Like the Father is trying to glorify the Son, and the Son's trying to glorify the Father, and the Spirit's trying to glorify the, the Son. Uh, just constantly other focus. Instead of selfish, they're self-giving. And here's the challenge about that. We're afraid of being self-giving because we're afraid we're going to be taken advantage of. We're afraid that we are going to be abused. But self-giving doesn't mean that you ignore selfish behavior. It just means that when you challenge it, you don't challenge it just because you don't like it. You challenge it because you actually want what's better for that person too. I heard this great story this last week from a guy I don't think who would claim to be a believer, but it was a great illustration. He lived next door to a guy who was a former Hell's Angel. I don't know if there is any such thing as a former Hell's Angel. Like, I don't know how you get out of that organization, but that's what he said, and so I'm going to believe him. And this former Hell's Angel, as you might imagine, was a really big guy and a really intimidating guy. And, of course, he drove a motorcycle, and, and he drank uh, levels of alcohol that would probably just annihilate anything twice his size. It was amazing what he could consume. And he had a real real challenge with alcohol consumption. And it would be like 2 o'clock in the, in the morning, and this guy would get a knock on his door. And, and he would answer the door, and it would be this, this former Hells Angel guy, and he would have a microwave, his microwave underneath his arm, and he would say, I, I want to sell you my microwave. And, and he's big, and he's intoxicated, and he's intimidating. And the guy would just say, okay, what do you want for it? <laughs> and, and he would buy them, and then he'd have a mixer to sell. He'd have a toaster to sell. He was always like, I mean, the guy just kept selling all of his appliances in order to keep the flow of alcohol coming to his house. And, and this, this guy's wife came to him and he says, we have to stop by, we can't afford this. And we already have a microwave and we already have a toaster and we already have a mixer. The next time he comes to the door, you have to tell him no. Well, that's easy to say. And sure enough, you know, this time it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's there with another appliance to sell. And he looked at the guy, and he said, I'm, I'm sorry. 
I'm not going to be able to buy that this time. And the guy kind of powered up and drew his shoulders back and leaned in and language gets a little dicey and why not? And the guy said, because I like you. And when you get money, you do things to yourself that take you away from me. And I value our friendship. And I don't want you to be destroyed anymore. So I can't help you destroy yourself. I'm sorry. And that man didn't beat down the door and he didn't hit him because it's not somebody who's just reacting out of selfishness. It's this self-giving thing. I, I'm telling you, this is what makes the difference in our world. So the great story is actually a love story. The great story is also a story about dispelling darkness. When God speaks, there is light. Now, this is fascinating because the, if you read the creation story, the sun, the moon, and the stars don't get created until later. So how can you have light before you have a sun? But, of course, even science tells us there was a great explosion. And, of course, there's light and explosion. So, of course, there was light. Um, we just believe that God caused that explosion, not gas. But when God speaks, he provides instruction and direction into our lives. And it sends light into the darkness. And, and the, the darkness begins to be brought into order. And the chaos begins to be brought into order in our life. That's what happened in creation. And it's what happens in our lives when we listen. You see, we often interpret the consequences of ignoring God's instructions as punishment. So I've actually heard people say this. I don't know why they do. This is, astonishes me. They will say things like, well, you know, if a hurricane is coming to Florida and, and people are going to lose property and maybe even their lives, it's because God is punishing them, that they're worse sinners than us people in New York. Yeah, well, what does that say about our blizzards? I mean, think about this. You know? <laughs> Are we worse sinners than everybody else because we get four feet of snow in a day? I, I don't think so. I think that we're the same sinners as everyone else. But this is what people do. They see the natural consequences of chaos and darkness in our world, and they assume that it's the punishment of God. L let's suppose you go to a doctor and you have uh, an annual physical. My, my wife makes me get mine. And so I go, and they do blood work. And let's suppose the, the doctor comes back and, and she says, um, all right, look, uh, your cholesterol is high, and there's some things we found in your EKG, and so you're going to have to knock off uh, the, uh, the chocolate, the sweet. You're going to have to cut down on your ice cream. No more uh, bacon double cheeseburgers for you. And, and I could look at her and say, who are you to tell me how to live my life? And, I, and, and here's the thing. Like, she's not going to come out and try to harm me because I'm not listening. I'm not going to get out in the parking lot of, of her office building and have her out there stabbing my, my tires uh, because I didn't listen to her instructions, she's not going to cause any pain to come into my life. But if I don't adhere to her instructions that she wants to help me with, then I can do damage to myself. And this is what happens in our world. When God gives us instructions, he's not trying to limit our life. He's trying to fulfill it and expand it. And when we ignore those instructions, he's not coming to punish us. We're just living out the natural consequences of ignoring light that has come into darkness to bring light and order to chaos. So God tells us to put him first in our life. Why does he do that? Because when we put power first or fame first or money first or position or pleasure or whatever else it is, if we put anything else before God, it unleashes the forces of darkness and chaos into our lives. And then the only thing that's left is we have to try to control other people and medicate ourselves. When you're dealing with darkness and chaos, that's all that's left. That's what you have to do. So, and darkness, it comes in our world and into our lives in a lot of ways. Suffering in our world, that's darkness and chaos. Fear that paralyzes you, that's darkness and chaos. Confusion, not knowing which way to go, that's darkness and chaos. Denial, the inability to accept something is true, that's darkness and chaos. And what we need to know is that God has come to dispel that darkness to bring order to chaos. 
And that leads us to this last point this morning, and that is the way to become part of God's story is to accept his invitation. Look at what it said in John 1, verse 12. To all who did receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The one who made all things was willing to be unmade so that we could be remade. He goes to the cross, and darkness and chaos descend upon him, and he takes all the punishment, all the consequences that should be ours, and he takes them on himself. He enters into that darkness. The, the Bible tells us even at the time he's crucified, the sun is darkened during that moment. I don't know if it was an eclipse or what happened, but it just got super dark, and they put him in his body into a tomb where they rolled a stone in front of it. And so he enters into that darkness and into that chaos. And that is his story. He was able to overcome the darkness and bring order to the chaos. Faith in Christ does not eliminate darkness in our world, but it helps keep it from overcoming us and helps us overcome it. This is the moment that you get to decide to become part of God's story. This is the moment where you can accept the invitation that he gives. And this is what you should know. Please understand this. Everything that God offers, he offers by invitation. God is not here to threaten a single person. He just says, if you're tired of the darkness and you're tired of the chaos then there is a story you can enter that changes all of that. I'm going to ask worship team to come up, and I'm going to ask everyone here just to bow your heads right now. And the reason for bowing our heads, actually, is not because that somehow makes this moment more sacred. It's because it makes this moment more private. See, I think that the, the thing you're considering right now is significant. And I think that you should not have to worry about someone else watching you. And I don't think you should do something just because someone else is watching you. So that's why we ask people to, to bow their heads and just close your eyes right now. And here's what I'm going to ask you. You see, there's an invitation that God has made. Uh, he wants to speak light into your life. There's, there's wisdom and instructions for how to navigate the darkness and how to bring order to the chaos and he wants to do that for you in that regard he is no respecter of persons he doesn't love one group more than the other he doesn't prefer some people to another every single person on the face of this planet has been created in his image and his likeness and was created for relationship with him and if you don't understand that purpose, life is going to constantly be a mystery to you and a source of pain. So I'm going to ask this morning, if you want to accept that invitation today, I'm going to ask you just to look at me. And uh, I'm going to start over here by the side of the tent that's near the road on Chilite Avenue. And I'm going to go section by section. I'm just going to ask if, if you're making that decision today, just look at me and just keep looking at me until I acknowledge you. And then in a moment, we're all going to pray. I'm, I'm not here to embarrass you. I, I don't think embarrassing people into the kingdom or out of the kingdom is of any use. But I do think you could make a significant choice today. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And you can accept that today. So I'm going to start over here and on this side. And if you're making that decision today, just look right at me. I see that person, that person. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person, and that person. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking until I acknowledge you. All right, just keep looking. I see that person, that person. Thank you. Just keep looking. We're going to take a moment to do this because I don't want to miss anyone. Okay? I'm in this section over here now. Just look right at me if you're making that decision today. All right.
right, thank you. This section over here, just look right at me if you're making that decision today. I see that person and that person. Thank you. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. Thank you. All right, next section over, right in front of my podium. If you're making that decision today, just look right at me. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking right at me until I acknowledge you. I see that person and that person, that person. Just keep looking right at that person. Thank you. All right. Next section over. The one in front of the baptismal. Just keep looking right at me. I see that person, that person, that person, that person. Just keep looking right at me. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking. Don't give up. I mean, I'm, I'm coming. I promise. I see that person, that person, that person, that person. Just keep looking. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking. Don't give up. I see that person. I see that person and that person. Thank you. And the section that's over here. Just keep looking right at me. If you're making that decision today, you're accepting his invitation. Thank you. I see that person, that person, that person, that person. Keep looking. Don't give up. That person, that person, that person. Just keep looking. And last section, just look right at me if you're making that decision today. All right. Oh, I see that person. I saw you. <laughs> Thank you. Father, you are so kind to extend such an astonishing invitation to us and that you've come into the chaos and the darkness of our world and our lives and you've come to bring your light so that the darkness does not overcome us and you've come to bring order so that the chaos does not disintegrate and destroy us. And I ask today that you would help every single person who lifted their eyes not just see me, but help them find you. Help them make not just a decision in this moment, but help them begin a journey. Because the truth about every single one of us is we are not perfect, and we have put many things in our lives over our relationship with you or our relationship with others. And we have done damage to ourselves, and we have done damage to others. And you have come to rescue us from that. We are so grateful that you sent your son and he became the one who made everything, became unmade so we could be remade. I ask that you remake every single person who lifted their eyes in this place today. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, could we please welcome all those folks into the family of faith today? Now, we're going, to, we're going to sing in just a moment. But just before we do that, on this card, remember I told you there's an important part? There's a section on the back of it that you can check a box. And one of the boxes is, I'm not interested in Christianity. And if you're not, that's fine. We would never ask you to pretend anything in this place, ever. We, we think Jesus was relentlessly committed to truth. And if you're not interested, you can say so, and, and we won't bother you. Maybe you're interested, but you don't have enough information to make that choice yet today. You can check that box. Or if you just made that decision, you can check that box. If you're already a believer, you can check that box. The reason we do this is because if you've made that decision today, there's some information we want to send to you that will help you take the next steps of your spiritual journey. Would you all stand with me this morning? And let's lift a voice of praise to God.